Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, hey, everyone. I'm George, uh, George Pepper. I'm one of the founders and the CEO at Val, and joined here today by Saroosh Kaur, who's our head of engineering. Uh, over the next 30 or 40 minutes, um, if we just get the slides up now, we can yep. get straight into it. Over the next 30 or 40 minutes, um, we are going to talk to you a little bit about Val, uh, how we think about the world, how we think about the future of cultured meat, uh, and some of the huge technical challenges that creates for us. Um, just checking, Anita, can you see the slides now? Yes, looks great. Fantastic. Um, we're going to talk about some of the technical challenges that creates for us. And then Sarush is going to talk to you specifically about how we're using software and hardware automation to allow us to handle the extra complexity of working across multiple species. So with that, I'm going to get straight into it. You probably know who this man is. Uh, Charles Darwin is arguably the most famous and impactful naturalist of you know, all of humanity. His work still provides an incredibly important foundation for most of biology today. Um, what you may not know about Charles Darwin is he is famously a bit of a foodie. As he was sailing around the world on the HMS Beagle, discovering and cataloging and describing hundreds of exotic species, he also had a bit of a tendency to dine on them at the same time. Uh, this is not a well-known part of Darwin's story, uh, but it's something I find fascinating. And being such a scientist, he recorded detailed notes about the experience of each of the many, many different creatures he dined on. Amongst this wide range of creatures was the Galapagos tortoise, uh, a, the largest, old, so the oldest living land animal. Uh, they can live for hundreds of years. Darwin and his crew went to the Galapagos Islands and collected a number of tortoise samples, a critical species when considering evolution. And on the way back to the UK, they did exactly what you'd expect a man who dined on exotic animals to do. They ate some of the most important specimens they had collected. Um, funnily enough, Darwin had a bit of a habit for this. There's multiple records of him getting halfway through a meal and realizing he was eating something which was really crucial to his research. Uh, again, not what you'd expect of a, a world-changing naturalist. Amongst the species he ate and he documented, I just grabbed a couple, is the puma, which he described as tasting remarkably like veal, and this little brown rodent called Nguti or Nguti, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it, which he described as the very best meat I have ever tasted, uh, which is fairly high praise from a man who traveled around the world eating everything he could get his hands on. So this raises a question is if we have these records from you know, more than a century ago about all of these delicious creatures, why aren't we eating them today? Why is it that almost every single mouthful of food comes from just four or five different species being beef, chicken, pork, sheep, and goat? Almost every single mouthful of food on the planet around of meat on the planet around 97% comes from just those uh, few species. The reason for this is these animals are able to be industrialized so much more efficiently than any other species. You can take chickens and you can cram them into these awful conditions and they still grow, they still breed, uh, and they still survive without killing one another. The same is true for all of these major species. We eat these animals not because they're the best tasting, the most nutritious, the most functional, but because the creatures themselves can survive in these truly abhorrent and unethical conditions. Our approach to cultured meat is kind of different. Uh, we're kind of the crazy ones in an industry full of crazy people, um, which I think of as a very, you know, a badge of honor. Um, the way we think about cultured meat is in order to get consumers to change their behavior from eating animal meat, which is in spite of the way it's produced and in spite of the environmental issues, an absolutely delicious, nutritious, cheap and convenient product. We have to harness consumer selfishness. The transition to cultured meat has to be driven by individuals' desire to eat a product that is more decadent or more desirable from their perspective. What this means for, you know, what this could mean is a, a product that brings together the cells of multiple species to create something just more decadent. Think of something like that uh, metallic -y richness of a game animal combined with that really beautiful uh, sort of mouth coating pork fat and that uh, lovely golden crust that you get with something like a pork belly. Um, we could equally be looking at nutritionally dense products combining 
high quality hypoallergenic kangaroo muscle protein with salmon adipocytes, omega-3 rich salmon adipocytes to create a nutritional profile which is distinct and better than any single species. Or we could even go functional. We can go and pick out all the most L-tryptophan rich cells and create, uh, bring them together to create something which helps you get to sleep. There's an unlimited range of possibilities when we start to think about the value propositions we can offer to consumers to make these decisions selfishly when we're not replicating the industrialized animal systems that we eat today. And this is possible with cultured meat because unlike industrialized animal agriculture, we don't need to be thinking about which animals we can cram together and they'll grow and they'll breed effectively. We can think about whichever animals we can derive high quality and reliable cell lines that can grow at large scales. And that's why at VOW, our whole approach is to build the world's largest cell library, drawing on both domesticated and undomesticated species, a little bit like Darwin, just a, a, lot, a lot more ethically uh, than his approach. This may sound kind of crazy and kind of outlandish, building this library of cells and then uh, either producing animals that we couldn't farm or producing the meat of animals we couldn't farm or combinations that have different properties to what we already eat. But we've already seen transitions like this where products go from being described as an agricultural commodity uh, to being described as a branded product sold on the basis of its properties. If you wind back the clock to the 1940s and walked into a cereal aisle in any supermarket, almost every single product on the shelves was de uh, described as a one-to-one -one relationship to an agricultural commodity. You probably know what Cheerios look like and taste like and what the packaging looks like, but right now you probably couldn't tell me which are the five whole grains that go into making a Cheerio in 2020. Back when that product launched in the 1940s, it was launched as cheery oats. It was launched on the basis of the agricultural commodity it came from. And over the intervening decades, that product has been formulated and reformulated and changed. And now pretty much everyone in this audience, I would guess, knows exactly what the experience of that product looks like, even if they don't know the agricultural commodities that go into it. And ultimately this is our belief of where the world of protein is going. Walking into a supermarket 20, 30 years from now, you won't be buying beef, chicken or pork anymore. You're going to be buying a range of branded products, each of which will have a unique value proposition that you're interested in selfishly because it meets your need better than something which would come from an animal. And this is exactly what we're working toward at Bow, building a house of brands in this new category of protein building a wide range of product lines so that every individual, when they're making that decision, sitting in a restaurant or standing in a supermarket, is able to choose a cultured meat product selfishly. We're only an 18 month old company. We're young, even in a young industry like cultured meat. But in that time, we've already grown to 18 people. We've got a couple of big announcements coming up over the next few weeks, so keep an eye out for those. We're based down here in what is uh, undoubtedly the most beautiful city in the world in Sydney, Australia. And just a couple of months ago, we were lucky enough to partner with this man on the left in the black shirt, um, Neil Perry, uh, who's one of well, probably Australia's most famous chef, uh, to do a bit of a cook up with some of our multi-species cell library. We produced uh, products, uh, product demos from six of the more than 10 species that we're currently working on. Up in the top left, you can see some pork croquettes. In the top middle, you can see those beautiful goat sliders. The top right, you can see some alpaca with tarama, down in the bottom left, there's a rabbit tart served with mushy peas. Bottom middle, uh, harking back to our, where we started is a kangaroo dumpling. Down on the bottom right is some glassy lamb. But working on this wide library, this huge range of species magnifies every single one of the already incredibly difficult R&D challenges of cultured meat. Instead of just developing cell lines for a major animal species that we eat today, we need to be able to repeatedly develop cell lines for every species in our library. For each of those cell lines, we then need to be able to develop a media formulation that's best suited to grow it and a process that's best for both those cells and, those me and that media. This is a huge challenge in an already really challenging industry and the way we approach this is by building the whole company, building our whole R&D on this platform of automation and software to allow us to do that. 
And so now I'm going to hand over to Saroosh to tell you a bit about what that looks like and how we use these tools to empower our scientists to do their best and their most creative work. Awesome. Thank you so much, George. And we're doing a, a quick like transition thing, just running around on our little wheelie chairs. Um, thank you for painting that amazing picture of kind of what we're working on and why we're doing any of this um, engineering work here. So I'm, my name is Saroosh and I'm the head of engineering here at VAL. I'm working on the software and hardware automation to take all of these kind of challenges that we've talked about, all these possibilities we've been talking about and making them possible. So let's look, let's look at how that's actually made possible. Awesome. So here at Val, as a core premise that we constantly come back to here on Val Engineering, the belief is that you can take engineering, in-house engineering, not just third-party systems, but having engineers inside the building to expand on some of the capabilities that we have here, capabilities that will let us achieve this big goal, accelerate our R&D, so making sure that we can understand the cell biology, understand the processes, understand how we can get to those amazing food products faster, and ultimately bring that all together to feed billions of people sustainable food. So that, this is the kind of the core premise we constantly come back to. So what does that look like in practice? Well, it looks like if you're doing menial, repetitive work um, that's just data-driven work, it's information work, we do that with software. So every single scientist in this audience and actually everybody else um, in this audience as well, I'm sure you do repetitive, um, menial work in your job today. Think about the, the hundredth time you're renaming files so they can meet the, the, the kind of the, the standard team practice of how how your images should look. Or the last time you went into image J and ran that macro because it, this little piece didn't have batch processing. All of those things add up. All of those things slow us down and all of those stop us from getting to this big goal. So when we see menial information we, or work, we do that with software. And we'll get into more detail here, but I just wanna emphasize kind of this, this breakdown of things. So information work, see if there's a way to do it with software. Physical work, see if there's a way to do it better and faster, more consistently and in a more automated fashion with tools and hardware. So much of biological science today, you know, despite the huge, you know, difficult challenges of biology, some of this, a huge chunk of the time goes to simply moving liquids from A to B, pipetting from A to B, moving things around, moving a, a plate from here to there. What if we took a little, so much of that and started to use hardware, robotics, and tools to move that away? So here on the right, we've got an open trans robot, which we'll talk about how we use that here at Val, but a concrete example of how we can take that scientist in the room and make them more leveraged through tools and hardware. And then finally, if you're, um, sorry, not finally, but if you're using software and hardware to do so much more science than, than just doing it by hand and pen and paper, all of a sudden, you're also going to get all kinds of high quality data in a digital native format. And we think here at Val that you can take that data, structure it, process it, and bring it together in ways that let us make better decisions. And we'll talk about how we do that. But there's so many opportunities to um, take the data that's generated in a lab in an R&D organization and make better decisions off the back of it. And finally, um, capabilities. So there are just some things that just can't be done with human hands, not just slowly, not just painfully, but it can't be done at all. Um, anybody who's worked with a large bioinformatics data set or who's worked with um, devices where the, the, the scales become small enough recognizes that you just can't do things with human hands and you will need to use some engineered systems to tackle it. And this is another part of the, the kind of the, the linchpin of what we do here on the engineering team. The bottom line of all of these different initiatives that we're doing is that we want every scientist here at VAL and hopefully soon this whole industry to be doing the most creative and leveraged work every day. Let's, we're for bringing these amazing people inside the building. How can we make sure they're not spending any time doing painful, slow, inconsistent work that isn't helping us get to that big mission and instead doing their most creative and leveraged work every single day? Cool. So we've kind of talked about it in a little bit more detail, but let's get one more layer deep um, and get to some of the facts. So 
What's a concrete example of engineering being able to achieve the things that I've been talking about? The case study I want to look into, and this is just one of many, but one that I want to look at with closer detail is cell proliferation assays. Um, for the biologists in the room, probably self proliferation assays, you probably know kind of what I'm talking about, about but, I, but I want to go a little bit deeper and just talk about what exactly we're talking about here. So here at Val, and like many in the cultured meat industry, we work with adherent mammalian cells. And we want to understand um, in the media environment, so the media that you add to these cells, what components cause better and worse growth rates and better and worse cell outcomes. Um, and this is an incredibly important um, part of our R&D pipeline, one that we do again and again and again and again and again. And if you want to build that multi-species platform, we're going to be doing this hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of times. Um, and this is an incredibly important R&D process for us to be kind of optimizing and leveraging around. So that process looks like you've got some, um, some cells um, in, in cryo, you want to thaw those and culture those up. You want to give it um, different media conditions. You want to count up the cells in different media conditions to see if, a, if an added or removed media component helped that cell grow better. You want to analyze that data and you want to draw some experimental condition, conclusions and rinse and repeat. And you're going to be doing this again and again and again. So the standard way to do this and the way we started here at Val was to do this in, in six well plates, uh, you know, a human accessible format where you've got enough volume to be able to count up those cells on a hemocytometer. A hemocytometer is a grid where you can count cells on a, on a microscope. And that's where we all started, just like many labs around the world. But of course, this is a very slow, painful process. And if you're doing this again and again and again, this isn't the most leveraged use of of our scientists and it's not the way we're going to get to that big goal so how can we make it better well um the first thing we did um was to move to using a liquid handling robot so we use an open trunks um this is not something that's like trivial to do um it may sound trivial but it really isn't um there's lots of little quirks and lots of um careful kind of tinkering in python that needs to be done to get this right but that's what we did and we, we kind of paid that cost and we, we used our engineering team to support the science team or we were able to do that. So we used the OpenTrons robot to do many of the first steps from um, culturing cells, from, from gelatin coating and seeding to feeding to fixing and DAPI staining those cells. And we moved to a 96 well plate format simply because you get to do more media conditions in a single plate. So instead of six, you get 96. So you're getting you know, a 15x improvement in throughput just by uh, moving to the well for uh, the larger, the smaller well, more wells per plate format. Once you've got a 96 well plate format though, you don't have enough volume to be doing hemocytometer counts anymore. If you, if you take out the volume, there's just not enough in there. So we had to find a different way to count up our cells. So what we did was to move to a world where we image those cells, we stain them with um, a DAPI stain, and we count up those cells um, by just doing image uh, by doing image processing in a piece of software called ImageJ. So this is great. We've we've gone from um, six well plates to nine six well plates. We're using the OpenTrons to remove a lot of the work and and and, and get a more consistent, um, less painful result for our team and move uh, increase our throughput. But there's still some room for improvement here. Um, imaging wells and counting up those cells still a really painful um, part of that process and really slow part of the process. So this became a new major bottleneck for us. So we looked for ways to improve on this. So now we've said, you know, we, we need to find a better way to do this. And to paint a little bit of a picture of why this is painful in the first place. So we started where many labs start which is you've got a camera mounted on your microscope and you've connected that up to a laptop and you're running some software. In our case, it was the Olympus capture software. So you're sitting there clicking, you know, capture, capture, capture on this, on this um, piece of software on a, on a laptop. You get these image files sitting in a, in a computer. How much time is the scientist sitting there renaming files to meet some particular format? Then where do those images go um, sure, you might be able to find it for that particular experiment, but if you're doing this over and over and over again for dozens of experiments, dozens of scientists, you're going to, one, spend a lot of time doing manual work. Your data set is going to be inconsistent across scientists and across experiments, 
and you're never going to be able to kind of search and filter across those. So it's both slow and, un, you know, it, it, you're not able to kind of dig into it to get all of the value out of it that you'd like. So if we're going to be, um, find a way, to, better way to do this, there's a few things we have to do. First, those cell cultures that people are imaging, we need a way to track them. Um, if we're going to try and capture images and tag against those cell cultures, we need a way to, to actually be able to identify and track them. We then need a, a good way to capture and catalog those images really quickly and painlessly. And then we need a, a quicker way, a better way to analyze those images as well. And let's talk about what we built um, in each of those kind of sub, sub parts of the problem. So the first one around tracking those cultures. Like many labs and many labs even to this day, um, people started off with handwritten labels. Any scientist here who's worked with a handwritten label knows how painful they are. Uh, it's hard to write on some materials. You can wipe them off really easily. People have bad handwriting. And also the only source of truth is what's on that label. Um, once that's been smudged off, you can't find it or someone's forgotten to do it, that's it. There is no other record anywhere in the system. You're never going to be able to build um, high quality tracking and better, uh, you know, create a better world for the science team if you're not moving off uh, handwritten labels. So the very first thing we did was just create really simple but really effective labels with some human readable and very easy to read, no more handwritten stuff. Um, labels for, for all of our reagents, all of our cultures, all of our core lab assets with also a QR code so that any automation, any uh, software systems around it could also identify exactly what they're looking at. It's interesting to note that even with this tiny little change from moving to QR labels with a, with a uh, database backing it, or what we call the limbs and what the industry calls the limbs, um, we not only got better labels and, and, and uh, solve some of these core problems for the scientists in the lab, we also got the ability to track um, stock levels and therefore be able to do stock ordering and, and improve our lab operations. We got the ability to do contamination tracing, which is incredibly important for when you're working with mammalian cells as this industry is. And everybody's lab books suddenly had um, started speaking the same language. When you see an ID in a lab book, it's incredibly easy to go look that up and understand exactly what they're talking about to, to a very high level of fidelity. Cool. Problem number two. So we've, now we can track our cell cultures, but we still want to capture images and catalog them really, really quickly. So what we did was build that little system in the photo on the left. What you see on the right is a little QR scanner. What you see in the middle is a, is a screen that shows the, um, the image coming out of the camera. The camera is just attached to the left there and then a little switch to the bottom left. So a scientist now, instead of um, figuring out laptop software and renaming files and all these things, instead, they scan the QR code that's on their, on their culture. They um, focus uh, either on the screen or on the eyepiece. They can choose which one they'd like to work with. And then they click that button and off the, off the image goes tagged against the culture, tagged with the microscope it was done on, tagged with the date and time. All of those details are fully captured because we know which culture it was tagged with. We know which species it came from. We know which cell line. We know its entire culture life cycle as well. In addition, that image, other than going up to our limb system and being able to easily filter and search and filter, which we'll see in a second, it also goes to Slack. So all of a sudden, you're seeing all kinds of high quality discussions between a distributed team of scientists all around the world. And this, you can see why in a COVID world, this is uh, going to be really valuable. And we'll speak a little bit more to that. But that's, that's another integration we were able to easily make because of the design of our system. Um, it's important to note that, um, you know, maybe that question here in the audience already is, oh, but didn't that take a lot of time and effort? I couldn't have just bought that from Carl Zeiss, you know, which is a reasonable question to ask. It's important to note that even including the engineering time, what we built there came out to be cheaper than buying a Carl Zeiss system. This is because in the life sciences world, which um, we're all dependent on in the cultured meat industry, Third party systems are often exorbitantly expensive. Not only that, they're not very flexible. You know, if you want to say, now I want to extend it to work with a Slack integration, or now I want to switch out the camera, or now I want to be able to finely tune that microscope for our lab's needs, a lot of those things that aren't possible, or even if they are, you're now paying another hefty price tag and, and long lead times as well. So it's important to call that out as well. 
And this is what we get as a result. Now we've been able to capture those images. You can go in and see exactly all of the, you know, it's trivial for me to look at every image that's ever been captured at VAR, tagged against every single culture and see exactly when it was taken, who took it, all of these systems, all of this um, critical information is there ready for anybody to look at. And this is so, so important for doing high quality science. And then finally, um, we needed to analyze the image, these images. We need to count up those cells. We need to figure out you know, how well did our media condition um, affect our cells. On the left, you see the kind of the old world, a point and click world with um, an open source piece of software called ImageJ. That's great. If you're doing one macro for one time, you might be able to um, build some extra, you know, use some of the batch functionality to get that to be a little bit faster, but you'll hit a limit eventually. Um, a very concrete example of the limit that you hit if you're not willing to kind of um, invest some, some careful engineering resources is ImageJ doesn't allow multi-channel batch processing. So what that means is if you're using the DAPI blue channel to count up your cells and you're using the red channel to look at your MF20 protein to see what percentage of my cells have fused into beautiful, delicious, soon to be delicious, mature muscle fibers, it's not going to be able to do that. And it's only, or it's only going to be do, able to do that once in a point and click fashion. You're not going to be able to automate it. What you see on the right there is the tool that we built to solve this problem. What you're seeing is four instances of image shape running through and batch processing our images. So now, instead of a scientist sitting there um, doing point and click work, or unable to get to the quantitative results they need at all, so potentially a capability issue or a throughput issue. Instead, they say, here's my thousand images. I wanna do my DAPI count in MF20 analysis. That's so important for my experimental results so I can understand how my latest media change is affecting um, the maturity of my muscle fibers that's gonna be this delicious food product one day. They just walk away come back and there, the results are there waiting for them. We deliver the results as a heat map on their 96 well plate. So they know exactly what the distribution um, of results look like on, on the 96 well plate that they started with. So now bringing this all together, you can see how dramatically um, you can improve the situation for, for the science team. Instead of pipetting by hand using hemocytometers, which for a ex single experimental condition can take around an hour and a half, which is not just an hour and a half of time, but an hour and a half of you staring under a microscope, looking at hemocytometers, straining eye muscles and, and getting you know, ergonomic issues in your hand pipetting. Instead, we design the entire process with automation in mind. We use an open trons, we QR scan and, and capture those images, and then we run them through batch image processing. And we're able to do, and these are actual times that we measured, we're able to do that for an experimental condition in a minute and 15 seconds. So that is an 80x speed up between the standard approach that's used in labs all around the world today and how we do things about for these critical career, critical cell proliferation assays. That's one scientist able to do the work of 80. That's 80 months of R&D being done in a single month. This is the kind of order of magnitude leverage approach that we want our scientists to be you know, spending their time doing to get to the results, to get to the outcomes, to get to the delicious cultured meat products that we are looking to, to hit here at Val. There's other wins too, and I just want to touch on a couple of them. Um, because we've built these systems in-house for our needs, they're incredibly flexible and they're incredibly, um, they're improving constantly. So what you see on the left there is our old camera and our new camera. Um, you know, the old camera worked just fine until it didn't. We realized that if you wanted to do low light immunofluorescent imaging, that it would take upwards of a minute. And if you're doing hundreds of photos at a microscope, that's going to be incredibly slow. So we switched it out for a higher quality um, embeddable Basler camera that you see there. And you, you get those images that you see on the right, these beautiful muscle fibers in under three seconds. So again, we said, here's a problem for the science team. Here's the system where we've got, it's flexible. Let's improve it for the, so that the, the scientists can work more effectively. Another bonus, um, everything we do here at Val is digital native from day one. Um, because those images go straight to Slack, when COVID hit, 
and our chief scientific, scientific officer was stuck behind um, restrictions in Melbourne, he was able to just see those images and start discussions immediately. And during this entire COVID period, George and I were just talking about this, our chief scientific officer has been more productive rather than less. Um, of course, you know, he, he, he's got a whole team of incredibly capable scientists um, here in Sydney, but if he wasn't able to communicate effectively, see the images, see what's going on through the different systems that we've built, he would have been much, much more limited in what he was able to do and much, much less able to do the work that he's been doing. So what have been some of our kind of our key learnings? We wanted to kind of share this with everyone so that um, others in the industry can also start to kind of understand um, how they can leverage all of what we've been talking about to, to great effect. So number one, um, leveraging third party systems is great, but recognize that in this industry, some things will have exorbitant price margins and they will have lack of flexibility. So be careful with what you choose. Open Trons, great. Open system, third party, cheap. Carl Zeiss imaging system, expensive, limiting, um, uh, huge lead times, not a good, great choice. Focus your efforts on iterative solutions that solve real problems. What I mean by that is don't look to solve everything on day one or solve for things that scientists aren't complaining about. There's so many pain points, slow, painful, inconsistent parts of lab work today. Focus your efforts on those and those will come together over time to build for really, really impressive high throughput um, pipelines, but you've got to start with the pain points. Um, the data that these systems generate is valuable, but it's a byproduct. Um, this was a hard lesson that we had to learn. What, but if you try and build systems that capture data, especially with any kind of manual data entry work, and they don't add immediate value, all you're going to get is scientists who are unhappy with that and um, not able to kind of capture the data they want or not willing to, reasonably so, because they've got other work to do. And so this was another kind of critical learning that we made, that focus on delivering the value and then the data comes later as a byproduct. I just want to kind of wrap up with everything we talked about to kind of just uh, to connect all the dots there. You know, what we just talked about with the cell proliferation assay is just one of the many different examples of systems and tools and software that we're using to kind of leverage our science team to let them do their most creative work. There's so many different opportunities to do this. As the cell proliferation assay case study showed, it's possible to get not just you know, 10%, 20%, 30% upgrades in productivity, but orders of magnitude. Um, and we think that these things will keep multiplying on each other. Um, our, our whole, you know, shtick here, the whole thing that we're thinking about every single day is we want to let our scientists do their best work, not low value grunt work, which is what unfortunately um, so much of biology R&D and um, by, you know, just by following those same protocols or so many cultured meat companies still have their scientists doing. We want our people to be doing their best work. We're going to get amazing people in the door. Let's make sure they're doing their most creative and leveraged work. This is just the beginning, like so much of what we're doing, you know, we've only uh, so young, such a young company, so early in our journey, there's so much more we can do here. And same with anybody who kind of takes the same um, uh, kind of strategy in this industry. And with that, um, we're kind of wrapping up here. I'll bring George back into to the video. Um, if you are a, a scientist or if you are in, in the food world, a sensory scientist or a food scientist, um, anybody else who's excited about what we're doing, go to, come check us out. Check out foodcom slash careers, shameless plug. Um, questions and stuff, we'll do Q&A right now, but also Twitter, CMS20 Slack as well. And with that, I think we'll probably jump into the Q&A side of things. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And we definitely have a couple shout outs already. Uh, one from New Harvest shouting out to Opentrons. Uh, Woohoo. <laughs> and then also um, a comment from Kieran that said in the Slack channel, so impressed by Val presentation. So, um, so great feedback so far. We have a couple questions as we go through this. If you have any additional questions, feel free to put them in the QA. Uh, we'll start with a question from Doug who asks, do you intend to license this characterized cell line library to other companies uh, or making these different products yourselves for consumers? 
the very short answer to that is at the moment we intend to be making these products ourselves is as a company our goal is to satisfy those selfish needs of consumers across the planet and we believe the most direct way to do that is to be vertically integrated to start with there's so many options that we can see down the line of licensing these out uh, white labeling products but right now our core focus is bringing some of these early products to market that are really really desirable and exciting so that everyone can uh, everyone that could potentially license them or white label products can see what these look like and understand how consumers respond um, in the first instance beyond that who knows i can see a world where we definitely would license um, but it's not our core focus great and um we have a question from anton and I'll preface with, uh, if anybody has used ImageJ, they've probably broken a few pencils with how frustrating the user interface is. So <laughs> automating that sounds great. Uh, Anton asks, will any tools that you develop be open sourced? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we love the open source community and there's so much that, that we've gained. So we'd definitely like to give back. So absolutely, it's just a matter of time. You know, some of these things, we just need to polish and make them useful. Um, but absolutely, we're, we're all behind the open source community and, and want, to, want to push stuff out there. And on that, um, Anton or anyone else, if you saw something today which you're like, if that was open source, that would be amazing. Yeah. Um, please reach out. Uh, we totally. would love to have a chat. We would be very, very happy to share um, and love to understand if your use case is applicable. Um, if nothing, nothing, nothing we've shared today uh, is anything we'd be uncomfortable making more widely available. 100%. Great. And uh, a question from Leia who asks, when do you believe you will begin pilot scale production? Uh, and then there was another question in, um, that I guess we can connect is that you're definitely in the R&D stage right now. Uh, are you looking to go into production of product or licensing your IP? Uh, and I think you answered that on the previous question that you guys do want to um, produce first and then license later. So in terms of any timelines for when you might get into pilot scale, any anything you can give us there? Uh, I won't commit to a timeline. Our big focus at the moment is on the R&D and on prototyping products. Uh, expecting in the two to four year range, we'll start to have those products in a volume which could become saleable. Uh, but right now our focus is really getting to that moment where someone can walk into our, our new space, sit down at the kitchen, take a mouthful of a product that's either a species they've never eaten before, or a mix of different species and go, oh yeah, <laughs> that's the future. Um, and that's what we're laser focused on getting to before we scale anything up. Great. Uh, in the earlier part of the presentation, we learned a little bit about kind of, you know, the, the uh, Darwin's, uh, I guess, uh, vast array of different meats that he had tried. And so. Uh, we'll tackle a couple of questions that are related to kind of the, the earlier part of the question. Uh, Catherine asks, um, isn't it rather the fact that these animals could be domesticated than predisposing them for livestock? Just looking at industrialization, which only started in the middle of the 20th century, uh, insects would be much better, less space needed, less, genera uh, less generation time, higher density. Uh, and I think that first part of that question is that, you know, we're, why do we eat the meat? we eat, it's because they can survive in these conditions. Uh, any insight on, you know, maybe what else could have been domesticated and also follow up with any thoughts on insects? I think the, the first part of that question is a really interesting one. And um, you're absolutely right, is uh, there was that domestication step before the industrialization step. I can't remember the statistic off the top of my head, but the diversity of meat being eaten has decreased drastically over the last century. If you look back to the early part of the 20th century compared to now, our diet of protein is way less diverse. It's really converged onto a few species as those are the species which for a whole range of reasons are the ones that have scaled up the most through industrialization. Um, in terms of insects, I love uh, the insect production process. I think it's a really compelling technology. Um, I, I can't see it entering human diets in a mainstream way. Uh, unless it's incorporated as an ingredient. Uh, whole insects are still texturally a very difficult thing to get over, especially eating a lot of them. Um, every year or so I get a bucket of edible crickets and I'm like, yeah, this is gonna be, I'm gonna enjoy these and I have two and I'm like, yeah, that's quite enough for me. Um, so eating them whole feels like it's not likely to be uh, sort of how, how we're gonna be consuming lots of protein in the future. As an ingredient, especially fortifying other foods, I'm a big fan of um, cricket hummus and cricket bread. Uh, really high protein, really tasty, 
um, quite nutritious, uh, but it's not something that I'll sit there and open a bag of crickets and chow down on them. And it's certainly not the center of the plate protein. And I think that's probably the key thing here is meat is something that sits in the center of your plate as a feature. Uh, insects are very unlikely to be that in my view. Great. And um, back to kind of the land animals that we're, um, that we're consuming. We have a question from Marcus that states, uh, George reasoned that the land-based meat market is compromised with species that can live and easily proliferate in small areas. Nevertheless, the seafood market is also dominated by a couple of types, types such as salmon, tuna, shrimp, lobster, etc. Despite the vast biodiversity of these of the oceans, how do you plan to successfully market these exotic meats? It's a really good question. Um, there's so there's. Uh, I guess there's a lot of layers to answer this. It, it depends on the stage of us and the stage of the industry. In the early days, when we think about how do you sell a premium price cultured meat products, it being something you couldn't otherwise consume is a really effective value proposition. To go to a chef, especially a top chef that stepped out of the, you know, stepped out on their own and just opened their first restaurant that's looking to differentiate themselves, to be able to put Galapagos tortoise on the menu is a pretty strong differentiator. And so the first group that we have to persuade are those uh, top chefs that are looking to stand out from a very, very busy crowd. Um, that's a relatively easy proposition. I don't expect to be walking into the supermarket in 10 years and buying Galapagos tortoise mints. Um, so over time, it, it's going to become much less about the animal source and much more about the properties. You might buy a product which has incredibly, you know, is a desirable product is, you know, your sort of everyday Tuesday night spaghetti bolognese mints but it does in fact contain cells of three or four different species you otherwise wouldn't eat. And what that means for you as a consumer is you're buying something which is really tasty, but it's also really high in protein and really micronutrient dense and also ethical and sustainable. Um, so from a consumer perspective, you're buying into the properties of that product, not into the animals that went into the cells that make up that product. Great. We, we have a uh, question from Elliot who asks, uh, what are your thoughts on the cost benefits of outsourcing experience, uh, ex excuse me, experiments versus doing them in house? For instance, culture biosciences or other cloud based platforms uh, can automate in a way perhaps that's faster and cheaper. And you might want to build the same process than if you were to build the same process in house. So the question uh, kind of boils down to what do you decide to build versus what do you decide to outsource? especially in relation to some of these already highly efficient automated cloud-based uh, services? Great question. Um, I could take a look at them. No, you go for it. Yeah, cool. Um, I, so firstly, love the guys at Culture Biosciences. Yeah, um, they were super generous. Um, Tim and I, and my co-founder and I spent a good three or four hours there um, fairly early on. It totally blew our minds. Um, when it comes to outsourcing versus doing in-house, uh, the main consideration is speed. For something like culture biosciences, especially for us as a company in Australia, to do an experiment with them, we need to freeze cells down, uh, work out how to transport media candidates that we want to them, uh, package all of that up, ship that across in you know 12 months ago, send a scientist with them to make sure everything gets set up correctly, uh, do the run, and then uh, analyze the data and repeat that for the next step. And um, so there's a sort of two to four week lag time added to that. So the question for us, is this a process that we think is gonna get stable enough on our end in the next 12 months, that that two to four week of lag time is gonna be immaterial? And right now, because we're so early and so much of what we're doing is changing really, really fast. If we said, these are the cells and this is the media that we're gonna go ahead for this particular study with right now, the odds are by the time we get those results, we will probably have something else that would have been better to test in that condition. And so when we're thinking about what we build ourselves, we want to make sure anything that we build ourselves, there's a distinct advantage of having that additional speed. Yeah. The other, the other aspect to call out there, firstly, you know, like George said, we'd be excited to work with them and we constantly talk with people like uh, Culture Biosciences, uh, Emerald Cloud Lab. So we're always open to this and, and, and have, they're an inspiration for us as well. But um, it's another thing is just the maturity of that market. Um, Culture Biosciences are an amazing company, but they're, they're not that much older than we are. Um, they, they've focused um, mostly on uh, microbial cultures. Now they're playing around with uh, Cho cells. They don't really do mammalian uh, adherent cells, so they don't do what we do. 
Same thing with Emerald Cloud Labs. Um, most of their work has been focused on analytical chemistry. They're only just now starting to work with cell culture. So if, if that had been created five, 10 years from now, our answer may be completely different, but the reality is that we're one of the those early people along with those companies trying to make this a reality. Interesting, yeah. And the software mindset is definitely one that you know, you can get instant results where traditionally within science and R&D, instant is not something that you are typically aiming for because it's rare. Um, and so, uh, yeah, definitely, definitely interesting and, and really kind of seeing what are the benefits of going to some of these services and, and, um, and or building them, them yourselves, in which case you showcase some really nice uh, and efficient uh, uh, examples. We have a question from Dario who asks, is your platform helping generate insights across species? And are you able to monitor end product qualities from the get-go? So for example, are you able to get such, so many characteristics such that you'll know that, okay, this is gonna be producing a really good XYZ product in, in whatever facet? Um, so probably uh, the short answer to the first part is yes. Um, the re one of the big reasons we started to lean on and build our own custom software was to deal with this multi-species problem. Um, if we have a candidate media or a sort of a base media, um, how do we understand how different cells from different species or different cell lines from the same species perform in that candidate standardized media to inform what are the most appropriate things to test? So that's a really core part of our philosophy is uh, build pipelines and build processes that allow us to look consistently across our growing library of species. Um, the second part is the holy grail of biology that we're working on, which is to be able to, at an incredibly early stage, know if a thing that we're adding to our library is going to result in a desirable product. Uh, that as a data challenge is kind of mind boggling. You're taking in genetics, transcriptomics, all the metrics we have about cell growth, bioprocess, sensory appearance uh, and even marketability. So it's sort of taking the entire end to end of Val and trying to take in some of those early pieces of data to determine whether any of those later things are going to be uh, promising. Um, so it's absolutely an intention. That's a huge goal and ambition of ours, but it's not something we're uh, yet able to do. I dream of a day where we can take like a you know a mouth swab from a tortoise and then say this is going to be you know an umami flavor. This is going to be an intense umami flavor and very high in um, a, a particular amino acid. But we're, we're a long way away from uh, that level of fidelity. Yeah, it's it's you know it's definitely something we're building all the pieces to get to. But there's there's going to be some time there. I definitely feel guilty having this thought, but tortoises also grow very old. So I wonder what the taste difference would be from young tortoises versus very old tortoises. And so we have a question from Nick that I'll separate out. How many tissues do you expect to make into the library? Uh, well, <laughs> that's a great question. And um, there's, so one, the short answer is we don't know yet. We're gonna just keep uh, we're going to keep growing our library fairly opportunistically at the moment. We have a few key questions we need to answer around um, product difference, sort of end product difference between our existing library to understand the value of, say, a thousand species library versus a 20 uh, species library. Um, so that is an outstanding question. Um, at the moment, I expect in the next 12 months, we're going to get to 20 plus pretty comfortably uh, just with this sort of opportunistic growth. Um, did that answer that first part, Alex? Yeah, so that was a, a nice answer to the first part. And the second, the second part of that question um, is, what do you think about reviving extinct species? And I will actually uh, put Kelly in the spotlight here because as a follow-up, similar question, somebody named Kelly answers, what other species are you trying, you know, think of trying? Uh, platypus, maybe? So maybe <laughs> sandwich with platypus? <laughs> um, the extinct species one, funnily enough, last April, uh, there was this really funny April Fool's article about this company, this fake company called Mamuti, which was reviving, um, reviving woolly mammoth for cultured meat. And my co-founder, Tim, and I saw this article one morning and we both freaked out. We're like, holy shit, these guys are doing what we're, they beat us. It was like <laughs> Mamuti raises a $20 million Series A and we're like really genuinely upset about oh, it. And no. it took us a good couple of hours to work out that it was in fact an April Fool's <laughs> joke. 
Um, the idea of reviving extinct species is a really interesting one. Um, what I expect is much more likely is as we build a library, as we understand the particular biological mechanisms that are responsible both for high quality cell lines and really high quality protein and nutrition, is there's, there is a scenario I can see at some stage that is definitely isn't a focus for us of constructing genomes to make partially or fully synthetic cells. Um, that exact same technology is being used to try to make synthetic mammalian cells at the moment. Uh, it's a very, very nascent technology. Uh, I can definitely see a scenario where we'd want to you know, resurrect an extinct species. Um, I can't imagine a scenario where that's going to be the core of our business at any point. <laughs> but using that same technology to construct cells as opposed to take them from animals is something that we've definitely talked about. But again, it's 20 years down the track. It's not around the corner thing. I don't know what George is talking about. I already bought JurassicFoods.com and <laughs> uh, it's my whole side hustle. So it's, it is going to be the core of our business. <laughs> And I think there's a new, uh, even another Jurassic Park movie coming out. So <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, and so I want to kind of step back a little bit, look a little bit more uh, broadly and, um, and bring in Dario's question, which is what are the bottlenecks that you're currently trying to uh, address? Or maybe also in a, a way to add to that, what are some of the current challenges that you are facing or can see that you may be facing shortly in the future? Um, gosh, um, it's, I feel like we, we got asked this question recently um, by an investor. They were like, what are the challenges or what are the things that you failed at? And we just sort of sat there, like Tim, uh, Tim my co-founder and I sat there, I was like, what haven't we been challenged by or failed at? The short answer at the moment from a technical scientific perspective um, is the ability to apply the same principles that Suru spoke about with that proliferation assay to later stages in the pipeline is so, uh, and the earlier stages. So um, right now, efficiently developing cell lines across many species is an area of sort of big technical focus for us. Media development's a big technical focus, but those later stages around uh, maturation of those muscle fibers and other cell types around uh, having highly parallelized bioprocess development uh, and then starting to do highly parallelized sensory panels or other product qualification. Um, those are areas which are huge technical challenges for us at the moment. Um, but really it's like, I, I feel like our entire life as a company has just been staring at a pile of gigantic challenges and just sort of picking off one at a time and working our way through them. So it's, it feels like a very hard question to answer because everything is challenging. Um, and we just sort of methodically work through that big pile. Yeah, and answering it maybe from a slightly more engineering uh specific angle i would say one of the challenges is is the kind of the the diversity of science you know it's not manufacturing it's not you do the same process over and over and over and over again by design every experiment should be different from one that been has that's been run in the past so identifying um areas that are the same so that we can find ways to leverage those or or building really really flexible tooling that can work for diverse scientific scenarios is a big challenge of kind of leveraging and speeding up R and D work. Leah mentioned you, uh, you you had mentioned being vertically integrated. Are you planning on bringing engineering and operations personnel on board directly into Vow? And are you thinking of really scaling to every aspect of of the product? At the moment, the short answer is yes. Um, we've looked a lot at different partnership options um, and different partial outsourcing options. Um, and right now with the immaturity of both the technology, the regulation and the market, uh, it doesn't feel viable for us to be really partnering or outsourcing on any of that, at least until we've done it once. And so we've recently stood up our own uh, so right now we have our science team, which is by far our largest team, engineering team. Recently, we've started to build an ops team, which is going to be a three-person team soon, uh, four-person team soon, um, and working on recruiting for a food team. So if you're interested in joining that, we have a few roles up at the moment, uh, as well as a commercial and branding, a sort of commercial branding comms team as well. Um, so right now, yes, we're sort of going into all of those areas, um, but that's by necessity so that we can iterate and learn fast enough in order to be able to partner effectively in the future. Great, you guys mentioned um, that you have a pretty nice labeling system. Uh, are you using a custom limbs system or what kind of limbs system do you have? Yep, um, we started on uh, a combination of uh, really just Airtable. So we use Airtable, which is a, a flexible point and click 
um, relational database system. And that worked really well for us in our early stages. And we've started moving into doing it custom. So we, we have our own custom um, backend system that we've coded up um, and, and front end as well. We did look at all of the kind of uh, the, the existing third party systems, you know, Benchling, LabStep, LabKey, all of them. And it's been a discussion that we've had multiple times, but we've landed on the fact that for Val, for the ambitions that we have for the level of automation we want to have, we just have to own that um, foundational data layer. And and um, and so for us, we've done it gone custom and we start on a table, not custom. Great. We have uh, another question coming in from Elliot. Are you selecting new species based on their uh, potential ability to bring productive aspects into the bioprocess? And it goes on to say, for instance, fast developing organisms, likelihood to create a certain tissue better, seals for fat, for example, ability to withstand shear, uh, mechanical mm -hmm. stress, et cetera, et cetera. Um, great question. I wish we had that luxury, to be honest. Um, one of the one of the slight challenges that we have, at least in Australia, or at least in where we are in Australia, is we're not able to do live biopsies at all, um, or it's a very potentially very problematic grey area to do live biopsies. Uh, and so we have to be much more opportunistic when we can access uh, when we can access a sample from an, a deceased animal um, in an ethical way that we feel comfortable with. So in the future, absolutely, we want to be uh, thinking very deliberately about the biology of a particular species. Um, but right now, especially because we're as a country completely closed to outsiders and can't travel, uh, we don't have that option at the moment. Um, but in the future, absolutely, we will be doing exactly that. And we do have a bit of a laundry list of what we want to, uh, what we want to access for uh, particular tissue types. Great. And as we're coming up on time, I'll kind of um, uh, ask the last question in two parts. Uh, what are the multi-cell line library consist of? So for example, fish, chicken, beef, can you shed any light on that? And uh, have you found significantly different needs for media based off uh, based upon this, the species? Um, so right now, the six species that we've publicly spoken about, uh, we have pork, kangaroo, uh, alpaca, goats, Rabbit and sorry, that wasn't keeping track. Uh, oh, lamb. <laughs> um, so those are the six species we've spoken about. We now have more than ten. So there's a bunch of other ones that we're working on as well. Uh, they're all land animals. They're all mammals um, for a whole range of reasons. We do have some interest, uh, definitely, in some marine animals as well. But right now, our focus is on land mammals uh, and getting to that point. Uh, media media requirements do differ. Uh, but there's a relatively, because we're looking at the same cell types uh, across species, there's relatively similar constituents. There's certainly uh, molecules or components of the media that are directly activating biological pathways, which do differ significantly between species. Uh, and that's probably the biggest difference. It's not a wholesale reformulation, uh, but we do have to think about different molecules for activating specific pathways between species. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. That's it for the questions. If anybody has any additional questions that do come to mind, please feel free to add them into the questions for speakers uh, uh, Slack channel and we'll get to them later this week. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having us. Alex, Anita, Cyrus, Marcus, thank you all so much. And thank you everybody with, who's with us as well.